Uh, good afternoon sa inyong lahat. Since I'm the only non-lawyer in the panel, I decided to focus on the memory part, keeping the memory of martial law. And I'm also a journalist, so that's one of my main interests. Now, why there is scarce popular documentation of the legal slay of mine that was behind martial law? Um, my co-panelists have given us authoritative accounts of the legal thinking that went into martial law. And as a journalist, I will look at why a gap exists between history and the popular consciousness. Uh, advertisement for ourselves. Now when my colleague, Chriselle Dayabish, is here, and I were working on this book, Our Rights, Our Victories, we tried to popularize landmark cases in the Supreme Court. And one of them is Habeliana versus Executive Secretary. We found out that while we do have access, as Dean Bakungan said, you can download the decisions and the opinions, we do have access to these, but on the, and also on the habeas corpus cases, what we don't have is popular literature for the non-lawyers, the general public, on the characters who had first-hand experiences, who participated in the shaping of martial law, their insights, their diaries, their thoughts and regrets, if any. Okay. For example, we encountered dead ends, and I think uh, this is really very sad. Uh, it speaks sadly of the state of our archives. The Supreme Court has no copies of the transcript of records of the oral arguments on the historic Habeliana versus Executive Secretary case. Our National Library does not have it either, neither does the UP College of Law, nor the libraries of Senator Javito Salonga, the late Senator Jose Giocno, the late Chief Justice Roberto Concepcion, and we met a dead end. Now, why, do we, why did we want to read this? Because oral arguments are quite important. Uh, I encourage the students to watch and listen to the oral arguments. It can be boring, but you get to know how the justices think. So lawyers face the Supreme Court and make their case for or against an issue. I find oral arguments very instructive because they give us an insight on how the justices think. Uh, we must remember that they're supposed to be like, uh, uh, not priests, but monks. They're not supposed to be seen. They're just supposed to speak to their decision. So when you listen to the oral arguments, we get the idea, an idea of how they think with the questions that they ask. If we had these transcripts, we would know how Estelito Mendoza, then the Solicitor General, argued for martial law and how Lorenzo Tanyada and Jovito Salong, Salonga argued against it with color, with the flavor of their language. We would know the kinds of questions the justices asked and how the counsels on both sides answered. We would have a sense of the historic deliberations, a feel for the event, and a flavor of the conversation that was taking place then. We would have seen some color in what was otherwise perhaps a very grim discussion. So personalities have had first-hand experiences of this defining moment in our history sadly declined to talk to us. For example, Senator Joker Arroyo, who was with Tanyada, Salonga, and Jokno then. On the other side, former Chief Justice Reynaldo Puno did not also grant us an interview. In the case of Puno, he has managed to hide this part of his past because he wasn't as visible as Mendoza and because of his rhetoric. Another advertisement for myself. When I was researching for, uh, on Puno for my book Shadow of Doubt, which was the first, my first book on the Supreme Court, I found out that Puno was one of Estelito Mendoza's second-tier lawyers his co-defender of martial law. Puno was working with the Office of the Solicitor General when martial law was declared. And during martial law, he stayed on as counsel of government for 11 years. He appeared in the Supreme Court during or arguments on, oral arguments on martial law, including Haveliana versus Executive Secretary. But listen to this, more than three decades after the declaration of martial law, Boone described, he described the regime he helped perpetrate as one of, and I quote, a slaughter of rights, in close quotes, a period when the Constitution was sent to the shredding machine. 
I, we found an account of a journalist who worked with the wire agencies then, who is now with the inquirer, Fernando del Mundo. He covered one of the oral arguments and remembered Puno vividly as part of Mendoza's panel appearing in one tragic hearing. Here is, here, here is his account. Uh, he appeared in one tragic hearing four months after martial law was declared in September 1972 on an opposition petition asking the Supreme Court to act and stop Marcos from promulgating the decision of a ramp plebiscit, which uh, Professor Pangalaman discussed uh, extensively. Uh, in the midst of the debate in the Supreme Court, news was relayed at that very moment that um, Malacanang, oh, I'm sorry, yes. In the midst of the debate, news was relayed to the Supreme Court that Marcos, at that very moment, had just issued in Malacanang a decree proclaiming that the plebiscite had approved, was approved by Viva Vot, Voce Vote, and the constitution that he said was now in effect. So while they were deliberating in the court, meron na palang decree si Marcos. And this is what Adel Mundo wrote. Caught flat-footed, the justices looked stunned. The court later issued a decision declaring the petition argued by Lorenzo Tanyada and the other opposition lights of the time, Jose Jocno, Francisco Soc Rodrigo, Covito Salonga, Sergio Ordonez, Joker Arroyo, Mood and Academic. Another thing, uh, uh, an important point, is we lack memoirs and independent biographies, those not commissioned by the subjects. In our research for our rights, our victories, we found some papers of Chief Justice Concepcion, thanks to his grandson, who is teaching here in UP, I forgot what department, who lent us the papers of his grandfather. Concepcion was the Chief Justice when Habellano was decided. Uh, he was considered uh, he dissented and later resigned from the court. But no one has written a book about Concepcion and has not left any of his memoirs. We don't have biographies or memoirs of justices who sat in the Supreme Court during the martial law years. In fact, notes of justices should be turned over to libraries or national libraries or archives so that the public can have access to them. I actually envy the journalists and historians in the US because when they write biographies, they, have, they make references to diaries, notes, memos of public officials, including justices. They're available for public use. Perhaps as a result of this, and the lack of classroom discussion on martial law, students today hardly remember this period in our history and hardly know the role certain personalities played during these dark years. In fact, uh, Chief Justice Puno became an um, Professor Emeritus Paz at UP College of Law. He was very, he was very well regarded. Again, in 2012, Chris Yabez attended a talk given by Estelito Mendoza at the UP College of Law. Unfortunately, I wasn't able to go. And she said that she was surprised that the students did not ask tough or incisive questions on Mendoza's role in the shaping of martial law. No critical questions. And she said some of the students were even giggling, apparently thrilled by Mendoza's presence, sharp mind, and wit. The last point I will talk about is the lack of literature on Marcos and his relationship, both personal and official, with the Supreme Court justices. The coziness just mentioned in the diaries uh, written by uh, the foreign author, uh, with the Supreme Court justices, the coziness of his dealings with a co-equal but independent branch of government. Uh, as we know, the justices should avoid meeting with the president because this, the executive department has pending cases with the Supreme Court, and of course, they're co-equal and uh, um, separate departments. But if you go through the actual entries of the Marcos Diaries, and I'll show you some of them later, he called some of them to the just to the palace. For, for meetings and for dinner. At least in the time of President Aquino, he, he only had one lunch with Renato Corona at the house of his sister in Green Meadows. But that's another story. So, so there's, I'll show you a few excerpts from the Marcos Diaries, the actual entries, which I hope you can go over. And because they can provide leads and information which historians uh, can check and use. These experts, excerpts will show the relationship between Marcos and the justices was not simply one way that he dictated on them. Uh, in fact, the justices 
uh, played along, and they also had their own self-interest to protect, like they wanted to stay on in the Supreme Court. So if you see in September, a year before martial law, uh, we all know the secret, Justice Fred Ruiz Castro was the great spy. So September 15, 1971 and 3. I'll just read briefly. Justice Fred Ruiz Castro, this is Marcos uh, talking, uh, writing his diary. Taking lunch with Senator Roy at the request of the former, suggested that I lift the suspension of the privilege of the writ of habeas corpus first in the Visayas and in Mindanao. He believes that this will make the Supreme Court decision unanimous, etc., etc. Et and then, I did put it in a slide, but on September 16, the day after, his entry says, I had dinner with Justice Fred Ruiz Castro and Senator Roy, and he affirmed that, one, the justices believe there is a rebellion, but not all over the Philippines. That if I leave the suspension in the Visayas, Mindanao, and some provinces of Luzon, the decision to uphold my proclamation would be unanimous. And then September 18, two days later, another entry of Marcos. I'm also disturbed by the statement of Justice Fred Ruiz Castro that the justices are only human and are affected by media, demonstrations, and propaganda or what is otherwise known as public opinion. So we move to the next slide. So a year later, on September 24, 1972, another entry of Marcos. This is quite interesting. He says, Jogno, Chino Roses, Max Sullivan, etc. have filed a petition for a writ of habeas corpus before the Supreme Court. Again, uh, you know, he talked to Tihanki, Barredo, Makasiyar, and Antonio. He, he said he asked them to see him and that they insisted that the government should submit to the Supreme Court for the court to review the proclamation of martial law. And then uh, Marcos said, so I told them in the presence of Secretary Ponce Enrique and Vicente about Santos, as well as Soljan Estelito Mendoza, that if necessary, I would formally declare the establishment of a revolutionary government so that I can formally disregard the actions of the Supreme Court. So he had more detailed entries. Uh, actually, you can get the, the complete entries from the PCGG library. Uh, I got it from there. The next slide. September 25, 1972, again, met Justices Fred Ruiz Castro and Salvador Esquera as a consulta. Consulta is a, a term you use in the, they use in the Supreme Court when uh, they say consulta, I'd like to seek your advice or your opinion. So Marco said, I told them what I, that I needed their help and counsel because you must keep all the actuations within constitutional limits. Justice Guerra said he feels it's a legitimate exercise of martial law. Then another entry is also interesting, October 11, 1972, he met again with the great spy, Justice Fred Ruiz Castro, and then Marcos said, I met Justice Fred Ruiz Castro. He has told the Chief Justice, referring to Concepcion, of my request that there be no direct confrontation between the Supreme Court and me. Justice Castro called attention to the fact that in all cases they have studied, the U.S. Supreme Court decided the cases after martial law was over. I believe they will do this. Next slide. On November 14, 1972, uh, the entry of Marcos reads, Estelito Mendoza reports that Justice Fred Ruiz Castro has the decision upholding the constitutionality, constitutionality of RA 1700, with only Justice Fernando dissenting and Zaldivar riding the fence, but the justices would not allow him to promulgate it. I have asked him to expedite its promulgation. When I was reading this, I was really shock because uh, of course this is all uh, not allowed between the, between the executive and the Supreme Court. Another entry, December 19, Marco said, in my conference with Justice Antonio Barredo tonight at 8.30 p.m. at my request, it seems that justices are concerned about the constitutional provision that they may be replaced by me by the appointment of their successors. He suggested that I issue a policy statement that notwithstanding this provision, I wouldn't use the power. So they were also asking for uh, something from uh, Marcos. Then another entry, December 20, he said, Met Justices Fred Ruiz Castro, Dindong Tihanki, Felix Macasiar, Tony Barredo, Salvador Esguera, and Felix Antonio. 
they recommended suspension of the effects of martial law during the campaign for the Constitution, etc., etc. Next slide. This one is, uh, is a reaction. I don't, you know, we, we're never sure if Marcos is telling the truth, so it's best to also check the news reports or other documents. But on December 23, 1972, it's a very interesting entry when he said, I am nauseated by the selfish motivation of the Supreme Court in questioning the power of the president to appropriate funds for the plebiscite, when all along, all they wanted was my promise that I would not exercise the power granted me by the new constitution to remove them from the Supreme Court. Two exclamation points pa. And the last slide, I think, second to the last. Again, January 27, 1973, he had dinner with the justices in Malacanang. Maybe if I were a reporter covering Malacanang, I would have loved to wait for the justices after they left the room. He says, it is apparent that the other justices are in favor of dismissing the petitions questioning the validity of the ratification of the new constitution. But they want to be assured of their continuance in office. Uh, and then here's interesting. Everybody else has accepted the new constitution. And as we put it in the dinner conference we held tonight, how do the justices ex expect us to unscramble the eggs already scrambled? He said we have to handle them with finesse, as the Supreme Court might become the rallying point of the opponents of reform. And then the last line, the dinner with the justices without the Chief Justice Concepcion at the time who, he said who is sick in Santo Tomas Hospital turned out well. The last. Yeah, I wasn't able to go over the other entries, but uh, I think there's a need for a uh, popularly written um, maybe book or a paper that will show how, the, how Mark was related with the justices. And of course, after 41 years, look what our lack of memory has brought us. Thank you and good day.